Cool. Welcome everyone. This is week six of OLS2. This is our third cohort call. Uh, what we're going to do today is talk about how we develop our project because uh, there have been some discussions around how to start setting up your GitHub, how to start thinking about different logistics you have around your project or the community. Uh, so the, some topics that we will talk about are agile development. We have Renato on the call who will give a talk on that. We will talk about open software. We have Alex who will speak about that. Open data, uh, Paula is on the call from Australia. And lastly, we'll talk about open hardware uh, given by Juli who is in Argentina. So we have a recorded video from her. Um, as usually, please, uh, make sure that you have your name written in uh, so that we can attribute your contribution to the HackMD properly. We also have nice icebreakers so we can collect some useful software for all of you. Um, so with that, I want to remind you, we have a code of conduct, which is applicable to this call as well. So if for any reason you have to report something, you can send an email to team at openlifesci.org. Or if you need to talk about something with one of the organizer, you can also use our personal emails. With that, I'm gonna give it to you, who's gonna explain you uh, how we're gonna conduct our breakout rooms. Thanks, Malvika. And sorry for my computer malfunctions earlier. Um, I ended up going and getting the computer I never use from downstairs and running and plugging that in and hoping the Zoom version was up to date enough. <laughs> Um, so anyway, uh, today, uh, just to talk about the breakout rooms. Uh, so in the past, we've uh, mostly used uh, spoken English breakout rooms. Um, and then in the last call, we experimented a bit with having uh, both spoken and written discussion breakout rooms. Um, and there's a few different reasons for this, but mostly it's to make sure that everyone can actually feel included and participate. Um, so we have a small link if you look around about line 60 you can see there's some more information about the different types of interactions we have um, both for the written and the um, spoken um, you can also catch up on that later it's not essential reading for now but if you also look a bit further down in our roll call um, you can see that we ha you have the option to choose either the written the spoken or both and if you don't have a strong preference then please do select both. That just means that when we are um, when we are selecting different rooms, that we can mingle um, different groups between the two. Uh, so I would just ask actually everyone now who hasn't actually added the emoji for the um, breakout room preferences, if you could just go to, to where your name is in the roll call. This is roughly from I think line 74 downwards um, and just add one or both of those two emojis. Um, and a little bit of a uh, guide. So if you're in a spoken room, generally this means that you can use English language speech uh, to communicate with regards to whatever the breakout room task may be. If it's a written room, there's two ways you can do this. The first is you can use the Zoom chat. So when you are in Zoom in a breakout room, the Zoom chat is private to the breakout room. So everyone won't be listening to your conversation. Uh, the, the downside of using a Zoom chat is that it, it can't really thread very well. So there'll only ever be one person talking at a time. And if you want to address something that's three or four comments up above, it can be a bit hard to follow. Uh, so the other way that you can do this is we have prompts in the HackMD which, which um, you can use, and then you can use bullet points and sub bullet points as a way of actually communicating and following threads. Uh, so for example, we have a breakout room further down, quite a bit further down. I don't know what line it is right now. I'm just scrolling to try and find it myself. Uh, <laughs> line 233. You're a hero, Malvika. Thank you so much. I'm just like scroll, 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 try not to miss it. So yeah, 233, you can see some examples where we have some prompts for different written and different spoken uh, breakout rooms. So is that reasonably clear? Can I have some thumbs up or thumbs down if it's a yes or no? Awesome. Okay, right. Seems reasonably clear. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, and we are definitely iterating on these and we will also very much appreciate any feedback or suggestions for improvement that we may have in the future. Uh, so definitely, you know, if there's anything that doesn't go quite right, don't worry about sharing that with us. Um, okay, what's up next, Malvika? 
Uh, we just want to say that you have finally chosen a name for your cohort. Your cohort is called the Mast Cohort. We had 11 votes on that the last time I checked. Uh, I would say that we will close the poll if you don't like the name. Um, we can also find out if you want to call it something else. But let's just call it the Mast Cohort. Great job finding a name. Uh, and with that, we're going to get started. I'm going to hand it over to Emmy about Open Science 1. Hi right, everyone. So um, yeah, this is uh, one of the first, well, the first of two calls on open science. Open science is a very broad topic, has many aspects and um, means different things in for different people. And so we'll be covering some of the aspects um, of open science projects in two calls. This first call will cover iterative project management, which is really important for collaboration. Um, and then open source software for reproducible peer reviewed code, uh, open source hardware for affordable and maintainable equipment, and then finally open data and sharing research outputs. And then in the next call, we'll talk more about um, open dissemination, so open access, preprints, open education, and citizen science. So, um, first uh, talk that we have today is from Renata. He is a um, mentor in this cohort uh, of OLS and a mentor and mentee in the last cohort. So I'll hand it over to him to talk about Agile and Iterative Project Management Methods. Okay. Hi, everyone. Let me just share my screen. Can I get some thumbs up from Emmy or Malvika? Yeah. All right. Awesome. So. Yeah, so today I bring you the Agile and Interactive Project Management Methods uh, as, a, as a topic. Um, first of all, I would like to say that I am not an expert on these topics, but I do use some of the principles and some of the ideas uh, that, that this framework gives us. So, so what, first of all, what is actually um, Agile? So Agile is a kind of like a combination of different techniques uh, with, uh, and you might see some of these keywords popping around. If you Google these terms, you might see Scrum, Kanban, Waterfall, and so on. And, and what these terms kind of uh, convey are just different strategies to organize and to plan a project. The, the agile uh, principle or the, the agile um, kind of uh, framework um, also has a manifesto. Um, and you can find this manifesto on the agilemanifesto.org website. And, and the name uh, itself and the, the process is mostly uh, focused on delivering content as quickly as possible uh, to minimize uh, like bureaucratic steps or um, things that are not direct, directly going to produce an output. And so, for instance, the, the emphasis on um, prototyping and, and working solutions rather than documentation, um, or, or for instance, um, actually interacting between people as opposed to just establishing bureaucratic processes. And, and the name itself, Agile, is, is in part as a, as a need to respond to change. Um, and this is something that you will see often in, in the business world. Um, and, and I'll explain how this kind of plays in, a, in, in the next slide. So if you're, if you're familiar with the, the more traditional um, way of planning a project, you have often uh, requirements set up from, from, from early stage. Then you have a phase where you just design and you kind of try to plan and to uh, think of all the possible situations where things can go wrong or you want to make sure that you cover all the cases. And eventually you get to a step where you actually implement um, the plan, you put the plan into action and, and afterwards you validate and you, you kind of have a, a delivery uh, in the end. Um, this approach uh, means that the time that goes between the start of the concept all the way to the delivery of the product is a very large period of time and therefore uh, it's considered a high risk uh, kind of approach because you don't really have anything until many months later or many uh, years later, depending what you're trying to build. To counter that, the agile approach is a little bit more dynamic. And the focus is that you have these, these kind of iterative cycles where you focus on milestones, you focus on achieving small goals, small deliverables. And 
and this will actually give you a, a better notion of, of progress and also a better notion of how uh, how how your how your how you are succeeding in, in achieving those milestones. So it, it gives you both the progress and something to show and to and to to kind of uh, feedback on. Uh, and then from there, you can also uh, learn what worked, what didn't work, and you can kind of go back to planning and readjust if anything needs to, to be done. And so this is a kind of like a cyclical process that goes back and forth. So th this process, I didn't specifically mention this, but this was a kind of a framework that was designed for, for software development primarily, although there's a lot of things that we can learn and apply to, to other projects. And how do you actually take this to your project and how do you apply it? So you can think of it as a, as a little bit of a, a Matrioska type uh, situation where in the end, the biggest Matrioska is your final product. This is what you want to deliver, but you're gonna have to break down uh, all the tasks that you have to do. You cannot just think of a project and, and do it all at once. You're gonna have to identify small steps that you can do. And, and the key aspect in the, in the agile approach is actually to break down uh, these processes in, or these, the, like, this big project into milestones that will be like the, the intermediate level uh, Matrioska in this case, and, and then tasks or even subtasks um, or issues in the, in the case of GitHub, for instance, where you have smaller um, steps that can go uh, between one and two hours or at most one day of, of, of working, of working time. And and so how, how could this be made into practice? So borrowing a, an example that, uh, that you set up from the, from the Intermind project, you can see this kind of um, visualization of, of, the, of several different issues. Each column represents a different version with an expected timeline and delivery date. Um, and then each of these little bubbles, or, or you can think of it as post-its as well. That's where the, the Kanban kind of concept comes from. Uh, it has a, a bunch of labels describing what they are. It has uh, a title and, and you eventually can assign or you can move things between the panels and so on. And the idea is that with this, you have a very visual overview of where you are in the project, what needs to be done. And you can also prioritize uh, things by just moving them up and down in this kind of visual list. And as soon as something is complete, then it can be uh, hidden from this view or it can be moved elsewhere. So in this case, this is a, um, is focused on a version. So each of the columns is a version, uh, but the more common approach is actually to have kind of like stages of uh, the progress. And here I'm borrowing the, the, the project uh, from my actually, uh, so the awesome uh, Open Science Montreal uh, project where they already started using this, um, this approach. And you can see that the, the, so the GitHub provides this standard to do in progress and done and and you can you can see how you can plan things and leave them on the to do and then everything that is being worked on is in the in progress uh, section with um, assigned to different people and so on and and one additional thing so mentioning this uh, this breaking down of tasks is that with github you can have not just issues but you can also have within an issue you can have uh, like bullet points that you can make into check boxes and these will be recognized as, uh, as smaller steps within that issue that you can then complete uh, and, um, and have as, a, as additional progress uh, for, for the task. And there's also a way to somehow automate this process. I have to be honest that I'm not super familiar with this, uh, but if you, if you want, there, there is a way to simplify this process further. Um, and but so in, in general terms, what 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 are these issues or what what could you make into an issue? And and so you can think of, for instance, if you wanted to make a website, you could try to break it down into creating content for the website as well as oops, sorry, as well as creating or uh, finding a, a domain to actually uh, have as, as the address for your website. And there you would have to, for instance, um, decide what domain that would be, agree between everyone, eventually purchase that domain and, and set it up as, um, uh, as, as the redirect for the GitHub account. And, and similarly, you would have um, to create the content and then the different 
parts of actually uh, creating the content, how you would go about it and the different sections of your website and so on. And you can think of each of these bullet points as an issue. And you could even think of these inner ones as for instance, these uh, checkboxes that I was mentioning on, on GitHub, for instance. And so um, there's also a, a live demo that has been set up uh, by, by, by the OLS team um, before. I will make sure to add that link to the to the uh, HackMD, and uh, and I'll add some additional resources as well if you want to read a bit more on that. And with this, I I think we can move to any kind of questions into the discussion. I will. Thank you, Renato. Um, folks, if you have any questions about Agile or any of the things that Renato mentioned, please feel free to put your questions. Um, into the hack handy, we're under line 213 at the moment with questions. Uh, there is a lot of interesting conversations going on. Um, so uh, if there's anyone, uh, would anyone like to ask a question um, verbally, maybe? If you, could, you could also unmute yourself if you'd like to do that. So. Yeah, so maybe picking on Sarah's uh, point on collaboration. So the, the Agile manifest does emphasize collaboration as a key point or interaction between people as a key point. But I guess this will, this will depend uh, a lot on, on what, you, what you want to do. Obviously, if it's a personal project, uh, this is kind of like entirely up to you. But if at any point you decide to involve someone else in that project, then, then I think it makes sense. And, and even as a, as a general overview, I do use uh, this project organization structure uh, in, in my own personal projects to have like uh, milestones and to break down tasks into smaller ones and so on. And, and this is why I was saying that uh, I'm not really an expert, but I do use some of the concepts uh, and, and they don't really need to be rigid. Like you can make them as flexible as you want. Thank you. Um, there's also a question from David on the HackMD. Um, if I could just repeat that. Uh, he's really interested in uh, the psychology and motivation of assigning people to tasks. Do people self-assign, get asked, or if someone just assigns another without discussion? Um, and in the real world, uh, Renato, what has worked the best for you? Yeah, so, so there I had mixed experiences. So it depends a lot on the project and it depends a lot how dynamic uh, the project is. Um, and it depends how you actually want to run the project. So in some projects, especially open source projects, um, you don't really have clear uh, responsibilities until you get with a high level of involvement with, with the team. So it's kind of like whatever is open as an issue, you could potentially contribute to that. Um, in, in a more structured project, you would have uh, parts of a project that are responsible, like different people are responsible for different parts of the project. And, and so you could use, for instance, labels and so on to assign to your, uh, to mark your issues as, as belonging to these topics. And, and I believe that in GitHub, you can even have uh, the labels kind of automatic feedback to some people so that you can then uh, assign yourself or you can pick from teams. I'm not entirely sure if it's possible to have more than one person assigned to the, to, to the same issue. Um, but uh, yeah, but usually you would prefer, like for for efficiency reasons, it's better to have one person responsible coordinating all the all the activity within one issue. I'd say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there is also a question from Kate concerning sort of the frequency of uh, tending to this. <laughs> so how how often do you tend to log on? Is it like every day or is it once a week? Yeah, so that, that also depends a lot on, on the project and depends how much time you can dedicate to it. So I, I have some projects where I go, I don't know, on a almost daily basis, even hourly, I have the tab always open. And, and I have other projects where I go once a week or even once a month, depending how much time I can dedicate to them. Um, but, but I would say that if you want to use this properly, then, then you can try to follow this um, uh, getting things done approach as well. I can add a link. There's a, there's a very uh, popular book or kind of oldish book on, on this topic. And, and, it's, and there you can also 
have a bit more of this breaking down of the different phases. So you first you kind of have a, a visual, you define all the tasks that need to be defined, but then at the end of every day, you also want to reassess uh, what was achieved, what was not, and maybe plan the, what the tasks that you want to do the next day and so on. So you can also break this process down further into um, like actionable steps or, or because it inevitably, if the project is big, you're going to have a, an overload of issues and, and you want to kind of prioritize some of them so that it, it doesn't overwhelm you if it's too many. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, all right, we are just on time. Thank you very much, Renato, for, okay. for all the insights and sharing your experience with all these methodologies. Um, next, we have Alex, who will be talking about open source software. Alex is an expert in this cohort of OLS, as well as the last one. Um, whenever you're ready, Alex. Hi, everyone. It's really great to be here. Can you see my slides at all? Or not? Oh, yes, you can. We, we saw them before. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, sorry. I oh, okay, because I couldn't see the green uh, frame around my window. I thought it didn't no. work. It's perfect now. Thank you. Uh, okay, so my name is Alex Senadic. I'm the training team lead at the Software Sustainability Institute. I'm based in Manchester, and I'll be talking to you a bit about uh, open scientific coding research. Big thank you to Yo for borrowing her slides from her workshop on how to contribute to open source. There is a link to that workshop as well if you want to, to visit. Um, she made my life much easier, so I just modified her slides slightly. Big, big thank you. Okay, so um, what, what do we mean when we say um, open source? The first thing to know is that open source is not the same thing as, as being free. So you have some free software, which is an open source, so it's free to download. You can, you can, it's free to use. However, you download some binary executable. Uh, you don't get to see, modify, or um, reuse the source code itself. On the other side, you also have some open source software, which isn't free. It doesn't happen very often, but for example, you have uh, you have software which is made openly available. However, sometimes you have to pay for support from the team um, or some um, extra help. So even though the source the the, so the software is open, you still have to pay for some services. However, there is intersection between the two where you have open source software that is also free to use. So what is open source actually? It's simply sharing the design of your work so that it can be reused and remixed by others. And it can be anything. We are talking about open source code. However, it can be a methodology that you can make uh, publicly open. It can be an algorithm. It can be data. It can be your photos. It can be anything that you're working on. Why should you use and promote open source source? So just a bit uh, on motivation. So the first thing is that once you make your work or your, your, your code public, it can be peer reviewed and um, reused by, by others. So you get second pair of eyes, you get more users for your code. There is something that we call hacker ethic, where, um, which means that nobody should have to reinvent the wheel. If you benefited from someone else's work, you should give back to the community by making your work open as well. This is also uh, making the science advance faster because people don't have to redo the same thing all over again. It also helps you get uh, more from the community so you can collaborate with more people who might be distributed around the world. Um, so you share your work, others share back, and it's, it's um, a bit of a back and forth interaction. Um, ultimately, you want your work and research to, to be reproducible by others and making your code and your data and your methodology open is the first step uh, on, that, on that road. Again, a bit on motivation. Why, um, why would you want to make uh, your code and your work open? There is a risk associated with, with, with the closed code. So perhaps the picture on the top um, is, you've, you've probably seen it recently because it put a spotlight um, on research code. 
during the pandemic. So the picture on top is uh, a mathematical epidemiologist, Neil Ferguson from the Imperial College. So uh, they, his team, they had a software on modeling pandemics and the software was in existence over the at least past 10 years. However, it was only made widely and publicly available in March this year. And of course, because of the wider scrutiny, it was put on, on, under, under a magnifying glass, loads of, loads of bugs were uncovered. So, and then the team perhaps unfairly received loads of criticism. Now, this is not the, the criticism of anyone's code. Uh, what the point I'm trying to, to make is if you release your code early and if you release often, um, you will get more eyes on it. It will ultimately improve your code. We, we all make mistakes and there is no code that is, that is bug free. Uh, however, you shouldn't be, be afraid to make those mistakes. Um, get it out of there. Uh, have others have a look. Uh, it can all make it can only make your your code um, better. It also aids transparency in research, uh, being open and publishing your your code and, and and software and data. So these top top guidelines for transparency in research have been created by journal founders and societies, and they cover not only transparency of your analytical methods and software but anything related to your research data, your research plan, all the research materials, everything. If possible, always try and make this open. There are obviously some constraints. Sometimes you can't publish your data due to some privacy restrictions. So over 5,000 journals have now signed up to these top guidelines. Uh, it's getting loads of traction. Um, you should follow it too. So how do you know if software is open? So even if source code is available and viewable online so it's published somewhere um, where you can find it and you can technically access it uh, if there is not a license associated with the code it's not uh, legal to reuse it so that's one of the most important things if you want to make your software public you need to have a license file stating that it is in fact legal to for your code to be reused or remixed in any way there are different license types uh, it's potentially a, a minefield as well. However, there is loads of help as well on how to choose your, your license. And once you do it, you need to specify that under a, a file, file uh, which is named either license or license.txt or license.md, which is stored in the root of your open source repository. So make sure that you always add a license to your software or to data or to photos or whatever it is that you publish, if you want everyone else to, to use it. So again, once again, no one can reuse it unless you give them explicit right to do so. Even in your, if in your mind you are thinking, oh, I want to make this open, until you, until you have a license file, uh, it's not legal to, um, to do so. Okay, so how do you go about publishing and sharing your open, open code? So the first step for publishing and sharing is version control. Version control is a system that records changes to a set of files within a folder over time so you can recall a specific version later. It gives you, uh, it gives you basically two things. It enables you to publish and share your code. And also um, it gives you a way to backup and version control your code. So you can always go back uh, to a version, uh, jump back in time. It's like a time machine for your code. It's a must have these days. It gives you, um, so as I said, it gives you both aspects, publishing and sharing, plus backup and version control. It's just universally useful. So why use it? What, what's it useful for? Uh, it, it's going to help you to never mess up again. Well, okay, it's not like you, it's not like you're not going to mess up, but it's going to make it easier for you to recover from your mistakes if you, um, overwrite your code over overwrite your data or, or, or make some make some blunder it makes collaborating or code so much easier as i said it also offers offsite backups because you're putting your code in a centrally um, central server you you don't actually have to back up your code on, on your external drive and anymore so for example, if you work on, on your desktop at work and then you have your laptop at home you don't actually have to keep uh, copying and backing up your code and transferring between uh, these two, you can just easily sync with the central repository um, and you're good to go. 
So what's not to like? Well, apart from learning uh, how to actually use a version control system, which we recommend that you do. So Git and GitHub, uh, Git is one type of a version control software. It's not the only one, but it's one that is widely used um, today. And then there is uh, GitHub as well, which is a central site that hosts Git repositories and also gives you a nice user interface um, to uh, Git, which is under the hood. There are other tools similar to Git and GitHub. You have Mercurial and Bitbucket. So Mercurial, Mercurial is a version control system similar to Git. Bitbucket is similar to GitHub, a user interface where you can host your repositories. There is also Git and GitLab. So GitLab is just a slightly different user interface to, to GitHub and uses Git underneath. So um, at the bottom of the slide, you have a link to your Git workshop if you wanna have a look at that. And uh, also we strongly recommending learning some version control system. It doesn't have to be Git, but um, as I said, everyone seems to be using it these days, Git and GitHub. So it's it's worthwhile and it will pay uh, off tenfold. There are loads of other workshops uh, to help you learn Git or to get you started with GitHub. So just a couple of uh, tips to make your uh, work open source. Oops, sorry. Um, so, so the first thing I've already mentioned, add a license file, because unless you have it, it's not legal to read your code. Try to avoid jargon, or at least try to explain it in plain English if possible. Add the readme file, it's also one of the must-haves to explain what, what your project is about, how it is used, how you can re, uh, contribute, how to report bugs. Uh, consider having a roadmap, uh, allowing others to see what, what's in your plans and how you can set your pr priorities. Contributing guide, if you, have, if you want others to contribute, uh, make a file called contributing.md in the root of your repository and set up some guidelines for contributors so that they know what they should do if they want to help you out. Issues, um, GitHub has issue tracker and um, again, other, other um, version control software also have um, issue trackers to record your bugs and supply new features. You can also use tags to make it easy to sort your issues. Um, have a code of conduct, all good projects have it uh, to, to make sure that everyone who contributes and is part of the project is treated well and state how violations will be handled. GitHub has a, a code of conduct wizard to make it easy for you to add one. Um, citation, if you use other people's software, you should cite it as well as you cite their research papers. And similarly, if you write your code, you want some credit for it. So in order to help people cite your software, add a citation.md file to your repository with a suggested citation on how, how to cite you. Um, consider getting a DOI for your um, data or code. It's now possible either using Zenodo or Figshare and uh, you get a DOI and then you also can use that to cite your, um, cite your project, your software project. Also add how to contact yourself and the team. Um, so uh, make sure you have your contact details there as well. So this is just a quick cookbook for, for you to get you started with, with open source development. The ultimate goal is full reproducibility. So you have many open computational tools around, such as R and Python, Jupyter Notebook or Lab, R Studio. You have Git and GitHub that I've mentioned already. And then you have Binder. Uh, so consider contain containerizing your software code and data to allow for full reproducibility and Binder. Uh, sort of integrates with all these other um, software tools mentioned above on this slide. So just some pointers for further reading and some activities for you to get you started or to follow up and where to go from here. How to contribute to open source um, software. So think about maybe some software that you like or that you use. Consider maybe um, checking some issues and see if you can contribute to that software. There is also the first timers only tag on GitHub to help you select um, some projects which are suitable to contribute for someone who is just, just new to open source development. Or, or there is a website, uh, website called firsttimers.com. You can try and participate in a Hacktoberfest or Mozilla Global Sprint or 24 pull request projects. They all happen throughout the year. 
Uh, there is just the Journal of Open Science software. You can uh, either submit your software to it or you can um, apply to be a reviewer. And finally, a great training resource on uh, the, the Turing Way, a handbook for reproducible data science. It covers loads of aspects of open source, but it also gives you the bigger picture on, on how to make your um, research reproducible. And with that, just wanted to thank you everyone. And I think I might have been slightly over time. I'm really sorry about that. Any questions? Thank you so much, Alex, for the very informative and um, insightful talk full of useful uh, tips and practices that you should follow for open source software development. Um, I think there is a question from Ariel. Um, is there much of a difference between Git or slash GitHub and Mercurial slash Bitbucket? Um, I think the principles are the same. So they are both distributed version control systems. Obviously, the commands um, that use that you use will be different, but I think many concepts would be the same. Um, I've only used Mercurial a little bit, to be honest. Um, I think I switched to Git at some point, and then I just remained there. I think you should probably go with what your community or group is using to make it easier for you. That's a very good tip. Thanks, Alex. Uh, folks, do we have any other questions quickly? <laughs> I'm sure they can still go on the HackMD under line 277 now um, if you have them, and I'm sure we can uh, help answer them as, as you think about what Alex has just talked about as well. Uh, for now, I'll hand over to Yo, who will begin talking about open data. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alex and Emmy. Uh, so, um, the next talk that we're going to have uh, is talking about open data and different ways to share data um, thoughtfully and responsibly. Uh, so, Paula, are you available? Um, hello, can you hear me? We can. <laughs> okay, just give me a second, please. I thought I was the last speaker. <laughs> Um, sorry, uh, you do have, um, oh, you're very slightly fuzzy. I don't know if there's anything you can um, do about the microphone or anything. Maybe not. If not, that's okay. Yeah, I'm going to put on my earplugs. Just a second, please. Uh, can you hear me better? That is much better. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, wait a second. Can you see my screen? We can, um, yes. Um, maybe I should share again the next. Okay, so while I do this, can you please, every one of you, write one or two words about what open data means to you? So, and I'll fill up the gaps in my 10 minutes. <laughs> Beautiful, that is everyone, if we start this on two, line 291. Thank you. Okay, I think I'm ready. Am I sharing the red screen? You are. <laughs> Good. My name is Paul Andrea Martinez. Uh, you can find me on Twitter via my handle orchid00. This presentation is open to you via Creative Commons CC BY4 International, and I've uploaded to FixChat. So I think I tick all the boxes that Alex just mentioned. <laughs> Great. So from the words that you just added onto the MD hack, I hope some of these are reproduced in this slide. It comes from the World Bank. Uh, it was an analysis they did with um, the Open Data Handbook and the World bank uh, survey and they mentioned that open data is many things for different people so it's an opportunity to share digital resources make the community participate and empower them by giving them access giving them transparency on how the data was collected and then um, share with with everyone by having no restrictions and making it available so just to expand on that 
I'd like to give you the definition of what open data means by the opendatahandbook.org. They say that open data is data that can be freely used, reused, and redistributed by anyone. Um, and on this uh, little cartoon on the right side, it says it's an unusual invitation for you or for anyone to use, modify, and enhance your work. That's the way that we can build on top of other people's work and keep improving them. Um, the concept of open data is actually nothing new. It comes from the, uh, since the internet started, there's some guidelines that people should be following that Tim Berners-Lee put together, trying to make it a very simple step-by-step process to make your data open as much as possible. So the first thing is whatever you want to share, you can put it online in whatever format you have, but under an open license. So we, Alex just mentioned there's different kinds of licenses depending if you have code or if you have text. Like in this case, I'm using Creative Commons for the license. Then if you want to go a step farther, you go and make that data available in a structured way. So for example, uh, you can put together all your data collected in a way that nobody can understand them, or you can categorize your data and put it into different sections. How was your process collected? How did you clean your data and how it's, uh, what's the output of that data? The third way is making this data, once it's out there, it's on the internet, you have put it together kind of in a spreadsheet, for example, you can, opt to have a non-proprietary or open format. For example, instead of having Excel that not everyone can open, you can have that as a text file or a comma separated uh, file. Um, so that other people who don't have access to an Excel spreadsheet software program, they can open it with an open source software program that exists for other operating systems. Um, the first step is that you will add a link or a URI to denote what you are sharing. And that is a URL. And we would like to have this URL as a permanent resource. So something that it's not going to change over time. And it's always going to point to the original data that you are sharing. Uh, once you have that, you make a very good progress. And the last step that you can make to contribute to open data is to link your data. So it's very unusual that you have a data that comes by itself, stands alone and links to nothing. So you have to try to put some extra information about how this data links to other data. If you've collected from other sources, if you've cleaned it from other sources, if you contributed with other people, all those things are things that you can link to your data and it provide context of what the result is. So with these steps, you are helping everyone and making it possible for others to reuse your data in a much meaningful way. Um, to continue with this presentation, I'll touch on these three points that I think are very important when you share your data. First is ethics. The second one is how you link your data a little bit more in detail. And then the fair data principles. So first for ethics, uh, a lot of people think that the ethics go just at the end. So when you try to communicate and distribute your data, you should be ethical on what you're sharing. But instead, I want you to remind yourself that ethics comes from the moment that you apply for funding. So someone is paying for this research and they want this research to be public or no? What's the motivation for that? How are you designing your project? Are you being biased or about your data collection? Um, how are you resourcing your data? How is your analysis being done? Are you um, influencing the results of your analysis by any process that you're taking? How are you interpreting the data? Are you skipping some steps? Are you trying to collect what goes for a better P value on your results, all of that is part of the data ethics. So remember that and, and think that ethics is all the way in your data product life cycle. The other important thing that I think why that open data exists, it's to create knowledge. 
And to create knowledge, we have to understand each other. So for that, we use standards or also we use the syntax. So for example, I've heard in a presentation about the human genome where people were uploading a lot of human genomes that now are easy to collect, but they will, some people will name it homo, other people will name it human, other people will name it man. So there's so many words that relate to the same thing but a machine will not know this if they're not part of a vocabulary or an ontology. And to see the difference, I'll recommend you to go into w3.org to see how you can build an ontology, where you can find ontologies that are already existing and how you can contribute to those and name your data in a reasonable way that has a relationship, that has a context and it provides the connection to what you're sharing. Uh, last but not least are uh, the FAIR guiding data principles. This is also not a new concept, but there was a published paper in 2016 about thinking all of the things you do. As a researcher, we usually have this little nice picture of our paper that is two or three pages long that we spend two or three years collecting and cleaning and putting together, right? So there's a lot of work performed that it's not visible to the public. And we want to emphasize all of that. We want to leverage the work that you're doing. We want you to have credit for the work that you're doing. So that's why the FAIR principles were put together as a guideline. And it has um, some steps and recommendations that I've mentioned before. And on this presentation, you have some links that I recommend you to follow. So the gofair.org explain them in simple English terms about what they are. Then there's the 411 Fair Data Principles Group. If you want to contribute, you can go there and, and help. And a new initiative that I'm also part of the chain committee is um, Fair for Research Software. So, Initially, the FAIR guiding principles were only for data, and now we want to have software as a first uh, citizen having the same principles applied to software. They relate a lot to the data principles, but there's some modifications that we need to do. And you can also read that paper, Towards FAIR Principles for Research Software, that was published last year. Um, some communities uh, that are being part of or that I'm still part of that uh, you can go and look up for more information are the Open Data Handbook by the Open Knowledge Foundation. The last OSL had a presentation by one of the members. There's a lot of information in the Digital Curation Center, not only about open data, but also licensing and many other topics that you're welcome to have a look. There's the Foster Open Science um, that has a lot of open materials that you can reuse. It also has tutorials. You can share them. They are all um, attribution based and they are open. Uh, as before, the Turing way that you might have heard many times already, then there's also the OpenCon Global Conference that has satellite conferences around the world. Now everything is online, so you can also um, start one of those in your locality. and. For the, top, the, the topic of open data, the Research Data Alliance, I think, is a very valuable resource. It's a group of volunteers around the globe that enables the open sharing and reuse of data. There's so many different topics. I welcome you to be part of them. And as Alex mentioned, if you want to start using open data, what best to put hands on into a hackathon, for example, there's a lot of challenges that you can be solving social, economic and environmental where open data can help. Um, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. This is um, also um, an open image by Patrick Hostenbach and the the open data is just part of the road to open science. I, I think all of you are following. And if you have questions, you can contact me by, by Twitter. Amazing. That's all, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Paula. That was a really, really interesting presentation. I definitely learned things that I didn't know before there. 
Um, so thank you so much for that. Uh, so if anyone has any questions right now, that is around about line three to four, or you can also type them in the chat. In fact, I see one here from uh, Mohammed. Uh, I understand reusing and accessing the data, but when the data is open to modify, does that not make it less reliable? I understand it can get improved, but on the other hand, it might just get ripped. Uh, any, any comments, Paula? Yeah, sure. Um, in open data, there's an important concept that is called data transformation. And I think it relates to this question in that when you use data that was previously collected for a different purpose, you transform the data into serving another purpose, you might be improving. I particularly don't know how to make it less valuable. Okay, we have another question from um, Emma. Where do you suggest putting links to old data to make your data five star? In a separate file of your repo or in a research paper slash data paper? Um, I'll probably recommend to put it in a different file, but then you also have to follow the guidelines of who is publish publishing your data. So some journals have specific places where you can put your data. Uh, but remembering linking is the key, right? So wherever you have it, uh, have this forward links from one resource to the other. I'll actually add one comment of my own on this is that small data sets is probably okay to put on GitHub, but anything big, you might want to consider putting it somewhere else, like perhaps Figshare or Dryad or Zenodo. Yeah, <laughs> um, some of these are for pay. <laughs> And another, uh, another question from Peter, data benefit sharing is a big worry for researchers in Africa. We're often where the sample collectors and analysis happens elsewhere. How can benefit sharing be maintained with open data? That sounds like a tough one. <laughs> well, um, I understand the point, but when you have open data, it doesn't mean that it's free, same as open software. So if you put open data out there with a license and the license requires attribution, you're also getting something back. So even if people are doing the analysis somewhere else, they're still going to cite where the data source comes from. And that'll give you citation points, they will give you recognition. You can also add the process of the collection. So there's other benefits of sharing them. Okay, we have one more from Kate Simpson. I think probably once we're done with this question, we'll need to move on. Um, but feel free to add more questions and then we can put them in the HackMD and follow up later. Uh, so Kate says, if data is collected from homes like temperature, humidity, building performance, and was not originally planned to be made open, do you think opening it up anon anonymously so the householders cannot be traced is okay or is it unethical? I think you're taught Ching on another important point that I haven't mentioned, which is uh, sensitive data. Um, sensitive data has some guidelines and yeah, making it anonymous or de-identifying the data is one of those. Uh, usually if you have to deal with sensitive data, you have to go through an ethics process. So that's part of the data ethics. And that depends on your institution, that depends on the kind of data that you're collecting. And also if you have consent of the people who you are collecting the data from. Thanks, Kate and um, Paula for that. I do agree that think, thinking critically about whether the data is something you have the right to share and whether it's okay to share is important and that we shouldn't be radically open. If, it, you know, if, if it's something that we, other people don't want sharing, then open data is not a good thing. <laughs> um, okay, um, thank you so much, Paula. I think we will now move on to our breakout. Uh, there is some nice uh, notes in the, in the um, HackMD about the Turing Way Guide to Ethical Research um, 
that, that, that this may address things like making sure that your data is shared ethically. Um, but moving on to the breakouts. So this is where we get to try out the um, new, new, new written and spoken breakout rooms that we've been working on. Uh, now I've done my very best to sort everyone correctly. Um, I've already noticed that scrolling up to find the um, emojis and then scrolling back down to the activity is a little bit challenging. So we may have to iterate on this further later. Um, but for now, the task for our breakout room is actually to think back to um, when we were, uh, oh gosh, there we go, talking about our iterative project management. Uh, so this is the first talk that we had from Renato. Uh, so think about the milestones that you have in your project and try to think what you would um, uh, what, what you would break them down to. So think, okay, so I know what my really big goal is, but what are some smaller achievable chunks that I can do step by step that I can add to my roadmap? Uh, so the breakout rooms, we have uh, about four or five people per breakout room. Um, we've done our best to sort you into the written or spoken. Uh, if at any point we have made a mistake or assigned you to the wrong room, um, remember that you can ask for help. I think you may be able to leave the room or sort yourself into new rooms if you have the newest version of Zoom, but I'm not sure about that yet. Um, so you can ask for help um, if needed, or, or also hop over to the Slack if needed to ask for help if we have sorted you wrong at any points or if you have any questions. Um, but as a reminder, the task is to try and discuss with others, uh, breaking your milestone down into achievable chunks. Uh, is that reasonably clear? And can I have some thumb, thumbs up if so? We have thumbs. Okay, I'm going to send you all off and we have about 10 minutes to discuss. Spend five minutes um, silently working on this and then five minutes sharing with your group. And I, we will be going in any moment. Amazing. Okay, are we all back? I think we are. Right. Okay, so hopefully you all had some good discussions in the breakout rooms. Um, so we just have a few quick minutes of sharing um, how, how, how this went. Uh, so this could be talking specifically about the discussion of breaking stuff down into agile or also if you want to discuss your experiences, especially with the written rooms, either is fine. Um, so there's some bullet points on line 410. I am literally going to mute for a minute or two and just let you all um, write down some thoughts. And then once we've had a minute or two to write down thoughts about what you found interesting and challenging about this process, um, we may run through some of the answers. So it's line 410 and 419 right now. Just a tiny reminder, if you're not speaking, it's usually best to make sure that your microphone is on mute just so background noise doesn't come through. Uh, I will mute a couple of people. Um, Okay, uh, so I'm gonna just read through some of the responses. Uh, so there's still a whole bunch of people who are adding notes to um, 
the, the room specific uh, groups and I can see some people talking about some of the things that they've broken down that they're planning to do in the future um, including twitch streaming of your group meetings which sounds amazing uh, talk about open that is incredibly open um, and then I also see some other discussions where people are saying they, they didn't realize about the time. Um, that one's on uh, me. Sorry, I should have been sending reminders about how long you had left and we will try and do better with that. I'm really sorry. <laughs> um, and Kate shares that it's really satisfying to break it down into really small chunks, but often something that you really do. Um, or uh, other people saying that watching each other's solutions to different problems can be really interesting and stimulating, which I absolutely agree. Like someone who's a pr project completely different to yours and seeing what they do, or just an external perspective, all of those can be really nice. Uh, does anyone have a comment um, or anything they'd like to share verbally, uh, that they'd like to share out loud? Okay, uh, we will move on. Uh, feel free to continue adding comments about your room if you wish. Um, and so our final talk is um, a talk by uh, Julieta. She's actually based in, uh, I think, Latin America. And right now it is quite early. So she was kind enough to actually pre-record her talk. Uh, so Malvika, over to you. Yeah, so to give a bit background, Juli is running a project called Open Hardware Leadership, which is a similar program as Open Life Science, but the folks who are developing open hardware. Um, and I have met her in different contexts where she had been promoting open hardware in Argentina, where she is based. Uh, and we really wanted her to, to uh, talk to our cohort and that's why I requested for a video. So I'm gonna try to share and please let me know if the volume is all right. Hi everyone, today I will be sharing some of the work I do as part of the Open Science Hardware community. What is Open Science Hardware and why I think it's important to discuss this in the context of, in the, context of the Open Science in general and Open and Life Science program in particular. So first of all, thank you Open Life Science for inviting me to share what we do. I consider um, our work is super complementary and I'm really impressed with the results of the program. Uh, about myself, I'm Julieta Arancio, I'm from Buenos Aires, Argentina, I'm currently living in Switzerland. I'm finishing my PhD on open science hardware and its contribution to democratizing knowledge production in the global south. And as most people in open science, I have many hats. So I'm also uh, co-organizing the Latin American um, community of open science hardware. And I have co-founded with Alex Cuchera and, and Andres Chagas a program that is a sibling of Open Life Science. It's called Open Hardware Makers, where we give um, support to new open hardware projects. So, but wh what is Open Science Hardware? <laughs> what is it all about? Okay, so it basically goes down to this. Um, people who want to make science need tools to make science. And nowadays, those tools are what we call a black box. And they are black box because we just input samples for information or some kind of input and we get an output out of them but we are not 100 percent sure of the processes that produce these outputs of course we know about the principles but we cannot inspect tools and the fact that we cannot do so brings many problems to researchers in general first of all this as we don't know how they work these tools are very difficult to modify and customize and um, I don't know if you are aware, but scientists are, have been studied to be one of the groups that customize their tools the most, which makes sense, right? Because you're always trying to uh, pursue new questions and to see a bit more. So you need your tools to be able to change with your ideas. Second, uh, being proprietary, these are hard to maintain. So we have a uh, horrible example, unfortunately, with the COVID crisis in, in the US where some hospitals um, didn't want to repair ventilators, afraid of breaking patent laws. Another example, another problem of this is that science tools are usually produced by a small number of companies 
and this are therefore able to set in general very expensive prices so many universities around the world cannot access to equipment so as you can see uh, these are consequences that consequences that are faced by almost everyone in academia but the impact is certainly bigger in those countries that have low investment in science and technology on one side because science tools are more expensive in the global south but also when science equipment breaks down let's say in the uk it's a very different experience as what it does in ecuador cameroon argentina so why because you depend on the supplier who charges you a lot for sending a specialist professionals or replacement parts this generates huge delays in the case that is possible and you also have the restriction of imports and exports which makes it very difficult to access so all this very practical stuff translates into questions that are not pursued translates into limitations for for research and less powerful essays and at the end of the day less diversity of perspectives in science and the main idea or the main takeaway here is that we are reinforcing the pattern where most science is produced by those who have already money to produce it so some people started thinking about why not opening the designs of science tools and some uh, changes in access to hardware design during the last 10 years makes us think that it's possible so for example the availability of software free open source software for designing and testing hardware the rise of 3D printing, uh, ideal for prototyping and for low volume distributed production, the access to cheaper electronic components and projects like Arduino that democratize electronic design, the massification of the internet as a way to share experiences and learn from each other, and the work of an amazing community that's been doing a lot for improving um, the ways in which hardware designs are shared. The good thing is that um, it's been a while and the results are showing. So here I'm just, um, I will just show three very good examples of open science hardware in action. Uh, but there are many, many others inside and outside academia. And the good thing is that because they're open, they can learn from each other. So on the left in Tanzania, Open Flexure is a project that has enabled a short circuit production of microscopes that are being used in education, research, and clinical diagnosis of malaria. Open Flexure is a UK project uh, originally, but they are producing now microscopes at a local makerspace, and this can be easily sourced, repaired, without dealing with imports and huge costs and delays. Another example, Audiomoth, is a success in conservation biology. You can imagine it as a very big ear that logs sound all around it. It has a very big community of users improving and customizing it, and it's leading to developing new methods to address research questions that before were considered untestable. Uh, finally, uh, here in, in Peru, epidemiology researchers have designed and built an, an open source device to track malaria spread in Amazonian indigenous populations and, and they were able to do so in a way that respects the preferences of these populations and that tolerates also the very difficult conditions, weather conditions of the Amazon. It's so uh, it's it, it's such a, a growth in open science hardware that we also see, for example, uh, policies, national policies, rec policy recommendations for Finland, which are suggesting uh, the country to adopt an open science hardware strategy at a national level. So that was th this year, 2020. So just to sum up, open science hardware is any piece of hardware that is used for scientific investigations and that anyone can obtain, assemble, use, study, modify, share, and sell. Because you can build, of course, hardware, but you may also want to just buy it and make sure that you can modify it or do anything you want with it later. The word hardware in some languages uh, may bias us towards electronics, but um, open hardware, open science hardware refers also besides standard lab equipment to auxiliary materials, sensors, biological uh, regions, analog and digital, uh, digital electronics, and also mechanical tools. And this huge circle in the middle reminds us that the heart of open science hardware is good documentation. So user guides, but also contribution, contribution guides, sharing files in edit editable formats, many other good practices that the community has defined to ensure that everyone has access to your hardware design with the idea of improving projects instead of constantly reinventing the wheel. So one of the main ideas here for the from the community is that 
if we really want open science to be transformative, we cannot limit open science practice to open data and open access to publications. That's a minimum threshold. But if we really want to open science to other actors inside and outside academia, we need to be able to share the tools we use to work. And this, as I mentioned, has benefits in terms of efficiency and, of course, reproducibility in science, but also in opening who is able to produce scientific knowledge and whose questions matter. So um, there you see the logo in the bottom. Gosh, community is the community gathering people pushing for open science hardware to be ubiquitous by 2025. And I really invite you to check the manifesto and sign it if you agree with our values. Finally, how can you get involved? How can you participate? Okay, so the entry point I would say is the GOSH forum. You see the URL there. Uh, you can drop a question. People are super friendly. You can search for the regional communities in the forum and connect to the people that are near you. You can also use uh, the Open Know How project, which was a findability protocol that was established for open hardware in general, not only for science, because you will see that open hardware projects are in many different platforms. Some of them are in GitHub, GitLab, uh, Wikifactory, Instructables, uh, Hackaday. There are many platforms, but Open Know How is a, a, a protocol that unifies findability, whatever platform your project is in. Um, you can search for keywords there. You can also read or submit a design to the Journal of Open Hardware. The cool stuff is that your documentation will also be peer reviewed, which is super interesting. And you can follow Open Hardware Makers in Twitter, where we will announce our next cohort after uh, this year, where we run a super big community and expert consultation uh, to improve our curriculum and program. So that's all thank you so much for listening uh, those are the ways you can contact me and feel free to ask me any questions thank you oops so that was huli um huli is on the slack uh, so you can ask questions there we have also left uh sorry Yeah, tiny glitch there. Uh, so that was it for uh, for today. Before we close out, we uh, want you to know that we also have um, homework for today. So let me find the HackMD. Just so you know, the homework uh, frequency is reducing now. Uh, what you have done in the past, uh, which which was about creating README file starting your contribution file, starting your code of conduct and road mapping. These are something that you will continue to advance. So it's not that the week have uh, week, weeks are over where you are going to work on this. So please uh, continue working on those aspects uh, in the next week. Please uh, start to share your project online. Uh, we have demonstrated Git pages. You can also use Google site, which could be simpler for a lot of people who don't want to use GitHub. We also can use WordPress free or other any um, platform. Um, if you want to just strictly be on GitHub, that's also fine, but please uh, have a detailed readme, please choose a license, uh, start working on your code of conduct. Create a project development plan. We have created a small assignment that can help you use agile method. Uh, the, that is linked in the line number 466. And after these assignments, think about uh, putting your roadmap up. Uh, but this is something that we will also talk about in next week, mostly because we will talk about science dissemination. So our project is not just about developing, but sharing as well. So this is something we want to start working on in the next week onward. Uh, with that, we are done on time. That's amazing. Uh, any questions that you have, we can take it in the last one minute, but I'll stop recording. Thank you for joining today. Thanks, Malvika. Um